Uh, I'm Dewi Fortuna Anwar uh, from the Indonesian Institute of Sciences uh, or LIPI. Uh, first, my uh, apology because I'm forced to use uh, my mobile phone uh, for these connections because I've just been having a computer crash. So um, uh, I'd like to thank the organizer who's promised to assist me with the uh, PowerPoint presentation. So uh, if you have it there with you, uh, uh, please, uh, can you show us a slide? Yeah, uh, since we only have eight to 12 minutes, we need to go very fast here. So uh, I'll we'll just go next to the next slide uh, on the Indo-Pacific. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, just very briefly to say that though there is a current use of Indo-Pacific now, but of course there's still debate about the exact boundaries of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, some would go as far as, you know, the Western coast of the United States to the Eastern coast of Africa. Uh, but for, uh, you know, the most important thing of course is that uh, it encompasses the Indian oceans and uh, the Pacific oceans, uh, which are home to uh, several countries uh, with different systems and traditions. Uh, but for the purpose of the discussions on Indo-Pacific, the most, uh, common uh, definition of the geographic boundaries is the triangular uh, space uh, uh, bounded by Japan to the north, Australia to the south, and uh, India to the west. And of course, Southeast Asia is right in the center uh, of this uh, Indo-Pacific uh, space. And, uh, and also this you know, justifies Indonesia's ambition uh, to call itself the global maritime uh, park room. Next, please. Yeah, uh, just a brief discussion about the uh, Indo-Pacific concept. Although people only started to talk seriously about the Indo-Pacific concepts when Trump uh, started to talk about it in 2017 uh, in Vietnam. Uh, of course, the Indo-Pacific concept uh, dated much earlier, in, uh, but for uh, the most common one, you know, that's been traced to uh, Prime Minister's Abbey's speech in the Indian Parliament 2007. Uh, the Australian White Defence Paper also started to use the Indo-Pacific uh, as a concept since 2013. And also the Indonesian Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Martina Talagawa in 2013 went so far as to propose an Indo-Pacific Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation. Uh, that didn't have much traction because, uh, you know, uh, that was the end of uh, 2014, uh, 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 the wise uh, presidency has already ended and, and uh, Martin Nergawa's position uh, was replaced so uh, that the Indo-Pacific was not mentioned for quite a while. And now Indonesia has embraced this concept and is about pushing for ASEAN to take a very active role in the Indo-Pacific discussion. And if you look at Indonesian uh, documents, uh, it's very common now for the Indo-Pacific to be used to replace Asia-Pacific. Next, please. Uh, I like, I'm borrowing uh, Amitav Acharya's uh, concept, you know, the Indo-Pacific, a lot of people talk about multipolarity, but uh, I tend to agree with uh, Mutaya that in multipolarity, one takes the assumptions of uh, several uh, centers of powers of more or less uh, equal weight, which of course in the Indo-Pacific region is not the case. It's diverse uh, types of powers, uh, first tier powers, the only two superpowers in the world uh, are now, you know, the United States and China can be regarded as the first tier powers. There are also second tier powers, uh, which can be regarded as major powers, which include, uh, of course, Japan, India, uh, Russia. There are also several middle uh, powers like South Korea, Australia, and Indonesia. But besides countries, there are also other uh, actors in the Indo-Pacific region, such as regional organizations like ASEAN, uh, the South Asian uh, Association for Regional Cooperation, OSHAC, also the Indo Indian Ocean Regional uh, Association, or IORA. And there are also, of course, uh, the existence of various minilateral or plurilateral initiatives like uh, the Quad and several other uh, cooperations like now uh, ongoing between Indonesia, Australia, and India, or between Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and, and Singapore, for example, the street lateral uh, initiatives are also a form part of the regional, regional architecture. Next, please. 
of course, the Indo-Pacific is now renowned uh, for its rise besides its dynamics economy. Uh, where this is uh, Indo-Pacific is considered to be the uh, economic powerhouse uh, of this uh, century. It's also marked by rising competition which also accompanies uh, rapid economic development. Uh, there are several competing major powers uh, and there are a lot of uh, territorial disputes, particularly in the maritime uh, area. Of course, there are um, the, the, the ascendance of China uh, with its assertive uh, military uh, activities in the, in the East Asian and South China Sea. Uh, and it's also its uh, border disputes with India but also China's very uh, aggressive, we might say, uh, outreach on economic activities with its PRI and so on uh, has also uh, been both uh, uh, a cause for concerns as well as uh, opportunities. And the main theme in the Indo-Pacific now is of course this US-China rivalry, whether we are returning into a new Cold War and you can also begin to see uh, this coalition rising to constrain China is not to contain China, such as the Quad uh, comprising the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. Uh, now I look to Indonesia. Next slide. Uh, yeah, uh, for Indonesia, uh, since uh, in Indonesia is of course an archipelagic state, uh, it has an archipelagic outlook since the late 50s and it's been at the far front in fighting for uh, uh, UNCLOS uh, and the recognition of Indonesian archipelagic state. Uh, but Indonesia's maritime interests have not really been as long as its uh, you know, identity as archipelagic state, because throughout the Suharto period, it was mostly dominated by the armies and its world outlook was much more continental. It's only since the, the Jokowi's administration that Indonesia began to pay more attention to the maritime domain and, and this aspiration to make Indonesia into a global maritime backroom, leveraging Indonesia's geographic position into something much more. And also at the same time, so reviving uh, this close connection between uh, India and China because Indonesia, Indonesia's culture, Indonesia's history has been very much influenced uh, by these two countries, uh, as, as well as of course, the influence of Islam and later on uh, the, the European uh, powers. Uh, next, please. And then uh, for, before we talk about the Indo-Pacific, uh, ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, uh, it's uh, important uh, to note that uh, in the Indonesian Ocean Policy uh, document, it clearly states that Indonesia uh, welcomes, you know, it's, it has a positive attitude uh, towards the various regional initiatives in, uh, of the major Indo-Pacific powers. Uh, it, it welcomes uh, China's uh, economic outreach. In fact, Indonesia is a member of the uh, uh, Asian uh, uh, in, in Infrastructure Investment Bank. And a bit of an interruption of the connection seems to. Uh, with the United States. Uh, the focus for the Jokowi uh, 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 government is very much in the economic development, particularly the infrastructure development. So if you look at the global maritime back group, uh, it's less about uh, the hard security issues, it's more about uh, economic development, developing connectivity and, and, and particularly infrastructure. Next, please. And when we are talking about, you know, uh, the, this world binary worldview of them versus us, which is, this is quite alien to the Indonesian uh, uh, worldview. Uh, Indonesia has, from the very beginning, supported a very open, inclusive regional architectures, uh, whether it is within the East Asian region or the wider Indo-Pacific summit. Uh, Lost her. Uh, 
I assume that Professor Dewey Fortuner Noir is trying to reconnect. I don't know. I sorry, I lost the connection. <laughs> I lost about two minutes there. But you uh, did yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, so from 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 its birth, Indonesia, uh, you know, in in its in positioning itself, because Indonesia, of course, you know, the birth coincided uh, with with the uh, the Cold War, uh, and uh, so it decided that you know, uh, as an independent country, Indonesia would have a free and active foreign policy. And as Stefan mentioned earlier, Indonesia hosted the Bandung Conference in 1955. And this Bandung legacy continues to inform uh, Indonesia's uh, foreign policy. So for as a, uh, you know, a, active, a free and active foreign policy means not joining any military alliances, not, join, not bandwagoning with any uh, super camp, and also always uh, aiming uh, to uh, preserve its strategic uh, autonomy. And the Bandung legacy is this peaceful coexistence uh, between different ideologies, polit uh, beliefs, and you know, political systems. So it's always been, you know, not not siding with any country, but preserving the agency, uh, and and uh, at the same time, you know, trying to to work with all, with all sides. Of course, during the Cold War, that has not always been possible. Uh, uh, you know, the Sukarno had tended to be towards the left, and Suharto because of his anti-communism. Uh, had veered more towards the right and not having, you know, pros relations with China. But since the end of the Cold War, I think this is actually the time when Indonesia has uh, truly been able to, uh, to exercise a free and active foreign policy and, 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 and non-alignment. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, um, there have been discussions when the Indo-Pacific discourse started to come up and Indonesia embraced it very early. And there were a lot of ASEAN skeptics at the time. There were suspicions that Indonesia was abandoning ASEAN to embrace, you know, back to the future type of thing that embracing a more global wide uh, foreign policy. Uh, and maybe, you know, ASEAN is no longer as central to Indonesia's foreign policy. But uh, that is not the case. Uh, uh, Indonesia continues to emphasize on ASEAN as the cornerstone of its foreign policy. But at the same time, it, it also opposes from the very beginning uh, any exclusive beyond ASEAN regionalism. Uh, next, please. Uh, if you uh, remember, uh, you know, for, for those who studied history, remember when uh, Dr. Mahathir suggested a more in exclusive East Asian uh, grouping, uh, uh, Indonesia opposed that, in fact, and then supported a more inclusive APEC. Also, when there was uh, suggestions, before, when East Asia Summit was first uh, uh, discussed uh, to formalize the ASEAN plus three, you know, the 10 ASEAN countries with China, Japan, and, 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 and uh, South Korea, uh, Indonesia was one of the uh, member, ASEAN member countries that opposed it from the very beginning. So in the terms of reference, you know, about what kind of structure do we have, we need to have so that it's not exclude China. Uh, for If you look at the East Asia summit, uh, the, the development, the concern was not not to exclude China, but not to make it Asian, you know, not simply. So from the very beginning, Indonesia had supported the inclusion of uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, in an, and broadening the, uh, the East Asia geographic print to include India. And then of course, you know, uh, also bringing in uh, the United States and, 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 and Russia. So uh, there was no appetite for a truly Asian uh, uh, ex uh, exclusive architecture. So, uh, and at the same time, you know, there's also no appetite to exclude any countries now that Indonesia has developed very close relations also with China. Uh, the next, please. We, I have to go very quickly here. The, uh, and then uh, we know that Indonesia took a lead in uh, drafting and pushing for ASEAN uh, to develop, uh, uh, you know, to have this discourse on uh, Indo-Pacific so that, you know, the ASEAN, which is at the center of Indo-Pacific, would not be sidelined when other countries come up with their free and open Indo-Pacific, like Japan and the United States, you know, and other initiatives. It would, it would not be in ASEAN's interest uh, 
uh, to, to, to be silent because then it will not be able to play centrality. So uh, as we know that uh, ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, uh, that's what he mentioned here, uh, it's uh, re-emphasizing you know, the, uh, the, the, the desire to keep ASEAN uh, as a, a regional architecture that is open, uh, transparent, inclusive, and rules-based, uh, and built on existing ASEAN mechanisms, both to promote norms and values, as well as to develop uh, functional cooperation. Next. Yeah, uh, the, the approach is, uh, Indonesia's approach is not, you know, it doesn't want uh, a new regional architecture, but to, to work on existing uh, institutions that already exist. So the approach towards an ASEAN uh, outlook on the Pacific is very much a building blocks approach. Uh, and it's not just multilateralism, but also, you know, enhance, strengthen bilateral relations, uh, as well as at the plurilateral level. Because multilateralism, especially at the ASEAN level, where decisions making are made by consensus, will not work if some countries are not, you know, buying into, into, the, uh, into the project. So at the bilateral relations, the ADIC relations remain, remain very, very important. And in 2017, um, Indonesia, uh, hosted the uh, IORA summit. That, that, that is the first summit, actually, of uh, the IORA, uh, which has already been around since the 1990s. And, and, and again, emphasized you know, the need to enhance cooperation in the Indian Ocean. And the idea is to bring linkages, to create linkages between the various bilateral, trilateral cooperation, as well as connecting, connecting uh, you know, the, uh, the various cooperation with ASEAN net mechanisms. And the stress has always been on positive co cooperation not based on suspicion or perceived threat. In the IOP document, you know, it actually talks about you know, not to fill the world in a zero sum game and to develop a habit of dialogue. Next. Uh, what uh, ASEAN envisages uh, is to, at least you know, from the Indonesian perspective that we need to broaden uh, the agenda of the existing regional architecture building block such as the uh, East Asia Summit, uh, instead of sidelining the ASEAN Regional Forum, which is truly in the Pacific in nature, you know, uh, uh, the ASEAN Regional Forum uh, need also to be uh, 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 revitalized and to develop synergy between the various regional architectures like ASEAN, East Asia Summit, ASEAN Regional Forum, and the IORA. Uh, but of course, next sli a slide, uh, challenges to, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the challenges to ASEAN centrality coming both from the external and the internal uh, dimensions, uh, you know the Chinese economic dominance. Uh, this is uh, uh, one cannot pretend that uh, some ASEAN countries are not becoming too dependent uh, on China, which of, of course, uh, in fact, uh, impacts also on ASEAN's uh, position. For example, on the South China Sea, uh, and um, the in intensifying U.S.-China rivalry has also, uh, you know, tended to. Uh, there is a fear that. Southeast Asia uh, could become again a theater of big power competition, and and uh, you know that countries will be divided again. The diversity of the ASEAN countries and is always a challenge, uh, and and making decisions are very cumbersome because it has to be based on on con consensus. And the capacity of ASEAN, unfortunately, depends very much on the uh, varies between uh, the chairmanship and domestic crisis. Uh, also distracts uh, from the uh, attention of member countries to ASEAN. And of course, the Myanmar crisis, if it goes, to, uh, goes on, this is going to impact on ASEAN, particularly if Myanmar is sanctioned by ASEAN's dialogue partners. You know, that had happened uh, in the past when ASEAN, ASEAN could not meet. Uh, and also the limits to ASEAN centrality. You know, uh, I'm very much in favor of ASEAN centrality and multilateralism. But we have to be realistic. It is not. It is not fair to expect ASEAN to solve world problems. You know, to it cannot. It cannot really solve real time problems. Uh, you know, it's not in the the business of trying to end U.S. China rivalry or resolve the conflicts between Japan and China, or even to resolve you know conflicts between member countries. So uh, in in this in this uh, 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 case, uh, there are, there are justifications that you know ASEAN forums are talk shops because that's what they do. They just talk, build confidence, you know, preventive diplomacy and so on. But when it comes down to resolving real business, even ASEAN member states <laughs> go bilateral or prelateral, you know, and, 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 and I don't think, you know, we, we need to cry too much 
to, too much tears for ASEAN inability to solve, uh, you know, to talk about sensitive issues. So in, in conclusion, again, uh, I, I like to uh, reiterate the conclusion, please. Yeah, uh, that Indonesia has embraced the Indo-Pacific concept and, uh, and that if, uh, and it wants ASEAN to continue to take a leadership role uh, to ensure ASEAN's relevance and centrality and that the regional architecture uh, will not be new, but one that is built upon existing ASEAN net mechanisms uh, based on building blocks approach and that the, uh, the architecture should be uh, transparent, open and inclusive and, 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 and so on. And, uh, and of course, you know, uh, second conclusion too, uh, I, uh, despite ASEAN skeptics, uh, the, the final slide. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I believe that ASEAN does need tough love, uh, but I believe that ASEAN mechanism is the only one uh, that does try to bring all sides together and provide some measure of coherence, you know, in this very complex multiplex Indo-Pacific region. But ASEAN's unity and co cohesiveness uh, is, of course, essential. So this is for ASEAN. You know, we, we need to get our own house uh, in order. And in dealing with the uh, ASEAN's relations with external powers, uh, I strongly believe, and I think Indonesia strongly believe, uh, that uh, ASEAN should be non-aligned, engaging with all sides, but becoming, becoming dependent on none. So back to that 1955 Bandung legacy, you know, I think I think that that spirit should continue to inform uh, the uh, you know ASEAN's approach uh, to relations with uh, with external powers. Thank you, Stefan, and my apology for that uh, technical glitch. Thank you.